Welcome, everybody. So, uh, still a few people coming through, um, but while I'm doing the introduction, we can do things in parallel so that uh, we get ahead with the talk. Uh, my name is John Evans. I'm on the committee of Friends of Imperial. We're a charity who promote the work of the college to the wider community. And uh, tonight we've got a very interesting talk on the science of skin by Dr. Claire Higgins. Um, I'll introduce both Claire uh, and the Friends organisation now. But this uh, lecture is one in a series of lectures. Um, you'll probably know that we've had a few already next week. We have a, a Friends event for members of Friends of Imperial, which is with Jim Verdi. That's at Friday, the 5th of March at 4 p.m. And it's What Lies Beyond the Higgs Boson. Jim works at CERN. And so that should be a very interesting talk. Then later in March, we've got uh, Professor Chris Jackson who presented the Royal Institution lectures this Christmas past, and he'll be talking about uh, his trip into the jungle volcanoes of Eastern Congo, which has got um, a lot of uh, people history and science at the same time. Friends, as I've said, uh, promotes the work of the college to the wider community, so we've got a lot of science going on. Um, We've been impacted by the pandemic, much as everyone else has been. Uh, so if you feel like donating to friends, that's something that we'd agree would be a very good idea. We just got about keeping our heads above water uh, with a bit of invention. But, uh, the more we get donated, the more we can do. Um, so we are in the throes of creating next year's programme. So expect some exciting news in the coming months going into summer as to what we've got ready for you in later uh, 2021 when hopefully we'll be back in, in the live theatre. So over to Claire Hins, um, I'm very grateful for Claire to, uh, to accept our invitation to, to come along and talk tonight. Um, she has been fascinated by the science of skin for, for decades and um, has pursued this interest coming to Imperial from uh, Columbia University in April 2014. Uh, her main focus of, of research, as well as uh, teaching in the Department of Bioengineering, is to understand the mechanisms of tissue development and regeneration, both in normal conditions and in response to disease or injury. And the importance of this work uh, cannot be overstated. Yeah. She won an award um, from the Department of Dermatology at Columbia University for her work. And her network associations, Imperial, uh, include Advanced Therapeutics, uh, Blast Injury Studies Network, Organ on a Chip Network of Excellence, Cell Regeneration, and Wound Healing and Regeneration. So, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm very excited to be able to introduce Dr. Claire, and I'll pass you over to her now for the talk. Thanks very much. Just one thing before before I disappear into the ether. Uh, remember, please, to keep your videos off and um, microphones on mute because the talk is being recorded as I speak. So I, I should have warned you about that right at the start. Uh, at least I've done it now. And thanks very much, Claire. Over to you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, John, for the introduction. And um, thank you all for coming to my talk. And as you can probably guess from the introduction and also from uh, the title of my talk, my lab works on skin. And it works on skin because frankly, skin is um, amazing. It, it's our armor, it, it coats all of our external surfaces uh, covering about two meters squared. And it accounts for about 16% of our body weight. And um, it protects us. It protects us from external factors, from pathogens, from chemical insults, from environmental insults. And it also protects us from, um, it protects our interiors. So it stops us from dehydrating, from drying out. It essentially keeps us hydrated. And this protective component of skin is all conferred in this top layer, the epidermis that you can see in this picture. And actually the epidermis of skin on the majority of body sites is very uh, thin. It's only about 
two millimeters or 200 microns thick across um, the majority of body sites, obviously on like the palms of our hands or the soles of our feet, it, it's quite a lot thicker. And it's um, only composed of about four or five cell layers. And these cells uh, are anchored to one another and they have occluding junctions between them. And it's the junctions between these uh, cells in this very thin layer that can confer this protective element. But there's a lot more going on beneath the surface. So the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, as I said, is about 200 microns thick. But then beneath this, we have um, a very large, uh, about 10 times thicker um, dermis, which has a ground substance, um, mainly composed of collagen fibers. And the dermis is also rich in blood vessels and nerves. And so if you cut yourself and you bleed, it's usually because the cut has penetrated through the epidermis and has reached down into the dermis and it's a blood vessel that you've actually um, disrupted resulting in uh, the bleeding that you would see at the skin surface. Now the dermis also has cells within it. Um, they're quite heterogeneous, uh, but the majority of them are dermal fibroblasts and these fibroblasts actually release the collagen that makes up this uh, bed of connective tissue that we see within the dermis. Um, Beneath the dermis, there's also dermal white adipose tissue, which you would more commonly know as skin fat. And then um, on different body sites, there are different uh, components to skin. So this is scalp skin on the right hand side. And you can see that there's many, many hair follicles within the skin. There's actually around 100,000 on um, the average human scalp. And these hair follicles go down through the dermis, down into the dermal white adipose tissue. Um, so they're about three or four millimeters long. And they have their own fibroblast populations that sit um, at the base of the follicle and also around the follicle. And their role is to produce a hair fiber. So even though there's many differences between skin across body sites, so some is hairy, some is not hairy. So we have glabrous skin on our palms and our, our feet. Um, and skin is of many different thicknesses across body sites as well. Um, the main function of skin, irregardless of body site, is for it to protect us. And so if, this, um, if the skin is compromised as a result of injury, it leads to a loss in this protective function. And injury can come in many different uh, forms. Things such as burns or incisions actually can occur in response to our surrounding environment. And they um, occur equally across body sites and also um, in different cohorts of individuals because they're caused by our interaction with our environment. However, comparatively, injuries that are caused by a mechanical trauma leading to blisters or pressure ulcers or tears um, do occur on some body sites and in some cohorts of individuals more than other cohorts. For example, um, we rarely get pressure ulcers on the hands or the soles of our feet, um, whereas we do frequently get pressure ulcers, it, well, certainly bedbound individuals uh, frequently get pressure ulcers on the back of their heels or on the back of their heads. And pressure ulcers are also five times more likely to occur in an 80 year old compared to a 60 year old individual. Uh, likewise, 90% of skin tears are seen in individuals over the age of 65 years. And so you can see that there's a clear correlation with increasing age and increasing fragility of skin, which leads to susceptibility to certain types of injury. Um, but because uh, we are human, our skin does not regenerate uh, like it does in lower vertebrates and any of these forms of injury all result in the same thing. A fibrotic response and deposition of collagen, which creates a scar. And um, while scars can uh, cause cosmetic issues, the main issue with scars is that they are not functional tissues. Uh, the skin is not like normal skin. It has a reduced number of blood vessels. It lacks nerves. And so scars have less sensitivity than healthy skin. And it also lacks agnexal structures. So they don't contain any hair follicles. They don't contain uh, sweat glands. Um, or uh, sebaceous glands or anything like that. So scars do not sweat. 
one of the main issues with scars is that they actually never regain um, the mechanical strength of healthy tissue. And this makes injury more um, likely, it makes them more susceptible to injury. So for example, 30% of pressure ulcers actually occur on sites where there was a pressure ulcer in the 12 months prior to the new injury. And so in, the, um, pres in this presentation today, I'm going to talk about work that's ongoing in my lab that we're trying to do to mitigate against all of these different issues. And I've chosen to talk about uh, three projects that um, are ongoing, and they each um, utilize very different experimental techniques. So I'm hoping, given the diversity of uh, the audience that we have today, that you will all find um, an interest in at least one of the topics that I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk first about work that a PhD student who went on to become a postdoc in my group, Helena Tapuzzi, conducted using in vitro and ex vivo human skin models to look at ways to accelerate uh, wound closure after injury. And then going to talk about work that a PhD student in my group, Magdalena Plotchek, did looking um, or using an in vivo uh, scar model to look at ways to remodel scar tissue back towards a healthy skin phenotype. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about work that a postdoc in my lab, Colin Boyle, conducted um, using mechanical engineering and computational modeling approaches to try to identify what makes certain skin susceptible to injury and other skin more tolerant to um, mechanical load. And first, we're going to talk about Helena's project. Um, so to start off, um, before I get into the kind of nitty gritty of Helena's project, I'll just say that we, we do know quite a lot about how wounds uh, heal. So if you have an injury to the skin that uh, compromises the epidermis and goes down into the dermis, uh, this wound will normally heal for a set of uh, coordinated and sequential processes. So initially we have hemostasis and um, inflammation um, in the wound bed, and then the fibroblasts in the skin dermis actually start producing a collagen to kind of fill in the wound bed. We get re-epithelialization of these epithelial keratinocytes over this bed of collagen, and once this re-epithelialization is complete, the barrier is re-established. And when that occurs, the fibroblasts actually then stop producing new collagen and uh, we move on to the remodeling stage of wound healing. And this remodeling stage in human skin can actually take um, three or four years to be completed. And essentially the remodeling um, is a coordinated process whereby the collagen fibers that have been deposited by the fibroblasts get um, continuously remodeled and that their architecture changes until we're left with what we know as a, a scar. And so the scar is actually in the dermis of the skin, even though of course we can see it from the skin surface. And we know um, quite a lot from mouse models. Uh, we know that there's different uh, fibroblast subtypes present within the skin and um, the proportions of these fibroblast subtypes that are present during wound closure can um, differentially affect the wound closure process. Um, we also know that hair follicles are really important. Uh, so this is work that was also done in, in mice and they used um, this kind of blue tracer to, to track where hair follicle stem cells, which are epithelial in nature, um, go after injury to the skin. So here is a skin wound um, that was freshly created. You can see there's hair around the edge, but the, there of course are no hairs in the center of the wound. And then five days after, you can see that these blue uh, tracks are coming in from the edge of the wound. This is um, hair follicle stem cells that are leaving the follicles on the edge of the wound and migrating in to cover uh, this wound. And then eight days after when the wound is fully closed, you can see again that there are these tracks along which the hair follicle stem cells have migrated to facilitate wound closure. Um, that work was actually conducted in 2004, but 60 years prior to that, George Holman Bishop had conducted um, experiments on himself, whereby he had demonstrated that the hair follicle actually has 
um, this role in wound closure. So he made wounds that were relatively shallow. Um, so some of them still actually contained uh, hair follicles. He only shaved the top layer off the skin. And he found in these cases where the wounds were shallow and some hair follicles remained, you can see the fibers are sticking up in, in this image. Um, in these cases, he found that re-epithelialization to cover the wound bed actually started from the remaining hair follicles as opposed to uh, from the wound edge. And that's these little white spots that you can see here. This is the re-epithelialization occurring. Now, in this situation, um, there were hair follicles present within the wound that facilitated this wound closure. Um, but a hair transplant surgeon, Paco Jimenez, who we collaborate with, has actually taken this one step further. And he asked if you introduce hair follicles into a wound bed, can that facilitate their closure? And so he took chronic wounds, which by definition means they've been open for at least six months, and he transplanted into them inside this blue oval that you can see here, um, hair follicles from uh, the patient's scalp. So quite large terminal hair follicles. And you can see that eight weeks after he transplanted these hair follicles, these wounds um, that had been open for six months prior actually started to um, re-epithelialize and close. And it's because the hair follicle stem cells were migrating out of the follicle and enabling um, re-epithelialization. And he took this one step further and showed that actually you do need hair follicles for this process. So when he grafted um, punch grafts containing hair follicles into a venous ulcer on the leg and compared that to punch grafts taken from the abdomen, so they contain no hair follicles, again, into the same ulcer on the leg, and followed this for 18 weeks, he saw significantly more closure on the side of the um, venous ulcer that contained the grafts containing hair follicles. So taking this all together, it tells us that hair follicles are definitely important for wound closure, but everyone so far has been looking at the role of the epithelial stem cells in um, wound closure. And we do know from the mouse work that I described at the beginning that within the skin dermis, fibroblasts are relatively heterogeneous and the proportions of these different fibroblasts can influence wound closure. And so we wondered, well, can the fibroblasts that are in the hair follicle influence wound closure? And this is what we decided to look at in this study. So we took human scalp skin and we isolated the different populations of fibroblasts that you see within the interfollicular dermis. These are these um, yellow cells here and these green cells here. And then we also isolated a population of fibroblasts that is found at the base of the hair follicle known as dermal papilla cells. And you can see in culture, they're actually relatively similar to, to one another. After all, they're all fibroblasts. And we, we characterized them. And then after growing them for a while, we added um, media that epithelial cells would um, normally be growing in to our dermal fibroblast cell cultures. And we left this media on them for two days, um, during which time the fibroblasts will secrete many different factors and they, that will be released into the media, essentially conditioning the media. And after two days, we collected this fibroblast condition medium and used it in our subsequent experiments. So we took um, epithelial cells and grew them in these uh, sheets in culture, and we created uh, wounds in the center of these sheets using a, a thin um, 200 micron pipette. And this is um, quite a well-used assay in the wound healing um, community. It's called a scratch wound assay, and it's just conducted, as I said, on this monolayer mono of cells. And so after you uh, create the wound, you can, you can see it here, the wound will close because the epithelial cells will migrate in like they would migrate over a wound bed to close this uh, scratch. And we can follow this process. So when we added um, our hair follicle fibroblast condition medium to the cells, we saw significantly accelerated re-epithelialization and closure of this scratch wound compared to the control and also compared to the non-hair follicle fibroblast 
um, subtypes and the, the condition media that they had um, conditioned. So we then modeled uh, this wound closure process as a logarithmic process, and that enabled us to get some more data out of um, uh, this or some more information out of this data set. We looked at the initial growth rate, so the initial um, slope of the curve, and we found that, the, again, the hair follicle condition medium significantly accelerated the initial growth rate relative to the negative control and the two non-hair follicle fibroblast subtypes. And lastly, we also looked at growth capacity, so the ability of the scratch wound to actually close. And we found that, um, again, the hair follicle condition medium significantly increased the growth capacity relative to the negative control and the two other fibroblast subtypes. And that's a um, scratch wound, so it's a monolayer of cells in culture. And we also wanted to see whether our hair follicle fibroblasts could facilitate closure of um, a proper skin wound. So we obtained um, skin left over from abdominoplasties and created these eight millimeter um, punches. And then within these eight millimeter punches, we made a two millimeter acute wound that went through the epidermis and just into the top of the skin dermis. And again, we followed this now for six days in culture. This is looking at them from above to see how these uh, acute punch wounds closed um, over time. And uh, this green uh, layer that you can see here, this is a cross section of skin, is the epithelial tongue that is closing uh, or migrating across the wound bed. The wound bed is, is this um, kind of pink, uh, uh, thing down at the bottom. And you can see at day three, uh, wound closure has not been complete, but by day six, we see a complete epithelium across the um, across these punch wounds, indicating that re-epithelialization has occurred. So again, we put our different condition mediums onto these uh, samples and we followed them and we looked at um, the extent of re-epithelialization at day six. And again, our hair follicle condition medium significantly um, increased the re-epithelialized area relative to the negative control and also to the two other non-follicular uh, cell types. Again, we model this as a logarithmic process. And when we look at the initial growth rate, actually the hair follicle doesn't um, really uh, kickstart the, the re-epithelialization very well, but it does significantly enhance the growth capacity um, within these punch within a punch wounds. So how is it actually um, doing it? Um, how is the hair follicle or how are the hair follicle fibroblasts facilitating this re-epithelialization? What's in the media? So again, we took our conditioned medium and we applied it to these uh, cytokine arrays, which are arrays with around three or 300 um, little spots on them. And each of these spots has an antibody located on it. Um, which uh, targets a different uh, growth factor or cytokine that could potentially be released from a cell. So if you run your conditioned media over these um, array chips, if the uh, growth factor or a cytokine is present within your media, it will bind to the respective uh, spot on the, this array. And you can then compare the intensity of um, the signal um, after running your different condition medias over the different uh, array chips that you've got. So you can compare um, your uh, hair follicle fibroblasts against your other fibroblast populations and see essentially what is in the media. And that's what we um, decided to do. So we compared our hair follicle fibroblasts against these papillary fibroblasts, which are found in the upper layer of the skin dermis. And we found that there were two um, cytokines that were released by our hair follicle fibroblasts at significantly higher levels compared to these papillary fibroblasts. When we looked at our hair follicle fibroblasts compared to these reticular fibroblasts, which are found in the lower layer of the skin dermis, we found that eight cytokines were um, expressed at significantly higher levels in our hair follicle condition medium compared to our 
a non-hair follicle condition medium. And actually, when we compared the two data sets, there were two cytokines, SAXL and CCL19, that came up in both. So we moved on and started to look at those in the um, and their role in wound closure. So again, we put um, SAXL and CCL19 onto our uh, scratch wounds and our, our two-dimensional cultures of epithelial cells, um, modeled um, re-epithelialization again as a logarithmic process. And to sort of summarize, uh, both SAXL and CCL19 do um, accelerate re-epithelialization relative to the control um, they also ex increase the initial growth rate and increase growth capacity, again, relative to the control. They're not quite as good as the hair follicle condition medium, which obviously contains many other um, components, but as individual factors that are present within this more complete medium, um, they do a relatively good job. We also looked at SAXL and CCL19 in these punch within a punch wounds. And again, they both um, significantly increase re-epithelialization relative to our uh, negative control. And in this case, we actually compared them to PDGF, which is the only um, federal drug agency or FDA approved growth factor for treatment of chronic wounds. There's nothing else that is out there. Um, currently available. And we found that both SAXL and CCL19 outperformed uh, PDGF, especially with respect to growth capacity or the potential to close this skin wound. So to summarize this first project, um, hopefully I've convinced you that the fibroblasts that reside within the hair follicle actually produce um, a kind of regenerative uh, secretory uh, secretome uh, that is capable of accelerating wound closure of uh, acute wounds. And we're now interested in going on and seeing whether the hair follicle fibroblasts can facilitate re-epithelialization in chronic wounds, which traditionally do not um, close and are, are not open. And the ones we're most interested in are diabetic uh, ulcers. But also at the beginning, uh, when I introduced um, the wound healing process, if you recall, I said that when re-epithelialization is complete, the dermal fibroblasts stop producing uh, this collagen that is deposited into the wound bed. And so there's a direct correlation between the speed of re-epithelialization and the amount of collagen in the resultant scar. And so um, naturally we went and we looked at our um, punch within a punch wounds that had um, accelerated re-epithelialization after we put our hair follicle fibroblast condition medium onto them. And we did see that there was less collagen in those, um, in those punch wounds. And um, we now want to go on and see, is there just less collagen because we, re we significantly accelerated this re-epithelialization process and they're just inversely correlated or is the collagen that is deposited by the fibroblasts uh, different in any way? Does it have a different architecture which could potentially lead to um, uh, a different architecture within the final uh, scar tissue? And that kind of nicely leads me on to the second project that I'm gonna talk about, um, which was this in vivo study to remodel um, uh, existing scar tissue back towards a healthy phenotype. And this project was um, performed by uh, Magda within the group. So the scar type that we're actually interested in is, um, is not that well known. It's um, a scar known as a stretch scar, which actually occurs in around 5% of um, uh, hair transplantation procedures. So in every 100 individuals that have a hair transplant, um, 95 of them will get a very small scar around one or two millimeters after removing the strip of skin at the back of the head to um, isolate follicles for hair transplantation. But around 5% of those individuals will actually get a stretch scar, which is about one centimeter in width. And it's actually very nice to, to study this scar because often um, when you work with humans, just there's so much diversity, like you work 
you'll have um, wounds from many different body sites, uh, all caused by different um, forms of insult. Um, but in this situation, we're, we're quite lucky to have um, scars that are always on the same location on the scalp because they've always been created by the same type of surgery to isolate hair follicles for this hair transplantation procedure. And so because they're relatively rare, um, before we started looking into how we could remodel them, we first had to actually just characterize them and see whether they are similar to normotrophic scars. And so we used second harmonic generation imaging to look at the collagen architecture within scar tissue and compare it to healthy surrounding uh, skin dermis. If you recall, the collagen is the uh, ground substance of the skin dermis. And um, using these SHG images, we were able to um, quantify uh, the changes in the collagen fiber architecture. So we found that scar tissue just had significantly more collagen than healthy tissue. Um, we also um, performed a machine learning algorithm to quantify the number of thick uh, fibers, i.e. more than 10 microns wide um, versus thin fibers less than 10 microns wide. And we found that scar tissue had a significantly higher proportion of thick fibers relative to thin fibers. And lastly, we looked at collagen alignment. And you can just see from the images, you don't even need to look at the graph on the right-hand side, that the fibers in scar tissue are highly aligned um, with one another. They're lying um, parallel with one another. Whereas in healthy tissue, the collagen fibers are much more um, randomly orientated. They're quite stochastic. We also looked um, at the epidermis and the dermis to see whether there were any cellular changes. And we found that the epidermis of scar tissue is significantly thinner than the epidermis of healthy tissue. Um, and we also looked at the interdigitation between the epidermis and the dermis. This is known as the basement membrane or epithelial um, epidermal dermal junction. And normally in healthy tissue, we see quite a nice amount of interdigitation at this epidermal dermal junction, but you can see in scar tissue it is relatively flat. Um, going down into the dermis, we looked at the number of cells across the whole of the skin dermis, and we found that there was a decreased dermal density in the scar tissue relative to the healthy tissue. And then lastly, looking at blood vessels, uh, marked with collagen 4, we found that the scar tissue just contained um, many less blood vessels compared to the healthy tissue. And one other thing um, that you will notice about uh, this scar tissue is that it doesn't contain any hair follicles, which it, of course is to be expected. Um, so just sidetracking for a minute, hair is, is really interesting because of the way it grows. So it grows uh, continuously going through different phases of a hair follicle cycle throughout its lifetime. And it's this which enables growth of hair to different lengths on different body sites. So for example, on our scalp, our hair is in a growth state for about seven or eight years, which enables growth of really long hair on this body site. Um, comparatively, hair on an, an eyebrow or an eyelash is only in this growth state known as anagen for about one or two months, and then the hair will move through to a different stage of the recycling cycle. It goes to a regression state and then a resting state, and then the hair fiber falls out, and then the hair follicle moves back into the growing state and produces a new hair fiber. And in humans, all hair or all hair follicles grow very independently from those hair follicles uh, surrounding them. So we have hair growth in a mosaic uh, pattern. There's no synchronization. And that means that uh, we don't have a visible um, seasonal mold. And actually we have, um, in, the, in this manner, we're very similar to guinea pigs. Guinea pigs also have hair that grows in a mosaic pattern, um, but pretty much every other species uh, has hair that grows um, in synchronization with the other follicles around it. So for example, if you take a mouse that is 50 days old and you looked at the state of the hair follicles, all of them on the back would be in a resting state. None of them would be actively growing hair fibers. 
And comparatively, if you took a mouse that was 100 days old and you uh, looked at all the follicles on its back, they would all be in an active growth state, actively producing hair fibers. And this synchronization that we see in mouse skin is really nice because you can look to see if there's any correlation with the state of the hair fiber and the state of the um, skin itself. Uh, and you can't do that in humans because the hair all grows um, uh, asynchronously with the hair follicles around them. Um, but actually, if we do look at mice and we looked at um, skin of a hundred day old mouse uh, with all the hair follicles in this active growth state, we would find that that skin was thicker uh, in the epidermis, the dermis and the fat layer and had more vascularization and more innovation compared to skin that contains uh, hair follicles in a resting state. And you can therefore kind of um, appreciate that mouse skin in with containing hair follicles in a actively growing state is at the complete opposite end of the spectrum to human scar tissue, which not only does not contain hair follicles, but has a thinner epidermis, a lower dermal density and a decreased number of blood vessels relative to the healthy surrounding tissue. And we also know from the mouse skin data that um, it's actually the hair follicle itself that influences these fluctuations in the surrounding um, non-follicular skin. And so we hypothesized or we postulated that if we could um, introduce a growing hair follicle into scar tissue, potentially this growing hair follicle could kind of remodulate or um, influence the surrounding scar tissue, leading to um, an increase in the thickness of the epidermis, an increase in the dermal density, and an increase in, num in the number of blood vessels, just like the growing hair follicle um, influences surrounding um, tissue during the hair cycle. And so we hypothesize that growing hair follicles could potentially be used to remodel mature scar tissue. And to evaluate this, we started a collaboration with um, a hair transplant surgeon, Paco Jimenez, who I um, already spoke about on one of the earlier slides. He's the hair transplant surgeon who was transplanting hair follicles into the chronic wounds or the chronic ulcers. And um, so we set up this clinical study whereby we transplanted hair follicles or terminal anagen hair follicles into these stretch scars on the back of a patient's scalp. Um, and then followed it out for six months to see if the presence of hair follicles was inducing remodeling of the surrounding scar tissue towards a healthy phenotype. And we took advantage of the observation that on the human scalp at any given time, around 90% of hair follicles are actually in this active growth state. So if we took 100 hair follicles for transplantation, we knew that 90 of them would be in the correct cycle stage um, for our study. So we um, performed this uh, transplantation in three patients with these stretch scars on the back of their um, scalps. And then we took biopsies at naught months, so prior to transplantation to establish a baseline, and then two months, four months, and six months after transplanting these hair follicles into the wound. And then we looked at how uh, the presence of hair follicles potentially was remodeling our scar tissue. And I just remind you that scar tissue in stretch scars has a thinner epidermis than uh, surrounding healthy tissue. And we found um, that after transplantation of hair follicles, we got this gradual increase in the thickness of the epidermis uh, from two, four, uh, three to six months. We also looked at interdigitation of the epidermal dermal junction. And I remind you that scar tissue has a relatively flat epidermal dermal junction, whereas healthy tissue is nicely interdigitated. And again, we saw this gradual increase in epidermal dermal junction interdigitation in response to transplantation of our hair follicles. We then moved on to look at the dermis. And I'll just remind you that in the um, in stretch scars, we see a lower dermal density and also a lower number of blood vessels compared to healthy skin. 
And after transplantation of our hair follicles, we found that the dermal density uh, jumped up at two months and then was maintained out um, and still remained high at six months after hair follicle uh, transplantation. And when we looked at vessel density, again, we saw an increase at two months that was maintained out past uh, six months at the end of our study. And then lastly, we looked at the collagen architecture within the skin um, dermis. So a scar tissue has more collagen that is highly aligned um, with a higher proportion of thick fibers relative to thin fibers. And after transplantation, we of course looked at all of these um, characteristics. We found there wasn't a huge change in the total amount of collagen, a, a slight decrease, um, but we did see a decrease in the proportion of thick fibers after hair follicle transplantation, and then um, a decreasing in collagen alignment. So we have more random organization um, of collagen at six months after transplantation. But so we know that um, the presence of the hair follicle is facilitating remodeling towards a healthy phenotype, but we have no idea how it's actually happening. So we decided to collect RNA from our, um, from our biopsies, just from the skin dermis, not from the epidermis. Um, and we reverse transcribed this uh, RNA into double-stranded cDNA, and then we hybridized this onto gene chips to enable us to identify genes that were both significantly and differentially regulated between the naught month baseline and the samples at two, four, and six months. And by using these gene chips, it enables us to do this analysis in a very unbiased manner. So there's around 40,000 transcripts on these uh, gene chips, and we just wanted to detect, to detect those that were significantly and differentially expressed between naught months and the subsequent uh, time points. And we identified around 1,500 genes um, that satisfied these criteria. Uh, so they were significantly and differentially expressed between naught months and then two, four, and six months. At two months, there were 751 genes that were significantly um, and differentially expressed. At four months, we found 650 genes, and then at six months out, 763 genes. And you can see that actually there is this core um, regenerative or remodeling uh, signature, which we're now uh, which was established at two months and then maintained through to six months. And we're now trying to um, investigate uh, what is regulating th this signature to try and understand how the hair follicle is actually facilitating this uh, tissue remodeling. But if we go back a step and we just look at the signatures at two, four and six months, and we look at gene ontology or terms that are overrepresented by the genes in our gene list relative to the representation of those gene ontology terms in the entire genome, we actually do pull out some relatively interesting terms. For example, at two months, we see a significant enrichment of the gene ontology terms associated with proliferation of fibroblasts. And I just remind you that after we transplanted hair follicles into these um, scars, we saw an increase in the dermal density starting at two months that was maintained out to six months. And when we look at the gene ontology terms enriched at four months and six months, we again see an enrichment of terms associated with uh, blood vessel development. So branching of endothelial cells, migration of endothelial cells, um, angiogenesis and vascular genesis, um, which is really interesting because we saw an increase in the number of blood vessels after hair follicle transplantation that, was, that started at two months and was still maintained six months after hair follicle transplantation. So hopefully I've convinced you that the hair follicle uh, or the presence of a hair follicle in a scar can lead to remodeling of the surrounding scar tissue, um, directing it towards a healthy phenotype. We see an increase in epidermal thickness, epidermal dermal junction interdigitation, cell and vessel density, and decrease in collagen um, 
total amount of collagen and also collagen alignment. Um, but obviously this, uh, we can't go around transplanting hair follicles into um, to every scar that there is because uh, in, in many cases it might be uh, cause a undesired cosmetic effect uh, that is potentially worse than having a scar itself. We don't want just hair on any body site. And so now we're trying to figure out how the hair follicle is actually eliciting this uh, remodeling effect. We think that it's due to a paracrine factor. We think the hair follicle is secreting something into the scar tissue. And we're trying to figure out what that is so we can harness that to remodel uh, scars on any body sites without having to uh, place hair follicles into them. And so that is where the work is going. Um, because of course, if we can remodel um, scars, we can make them stronger and they will then be less susceptible to re-injury, which brings me nicely on to uh, the final project that I'm gonna talk about today, which is work by Colin looking at um, or using computational modeling and mechanical engineering approaches to identify why some skin is susceptible to injury and some skin is not. And uh, the type of injury that we're actually most interested in, or the one I'm gonna talk about today at least, um, are pressure ulcers. And as I said before, we're, we're interested in them because they occur um, differentially across different body sites, um, but they're also much more common in certain cohorts or certain individuals than they are in other cohorts. So what exactly is a pressure ulcer? Well, it's an injury that occurs when you compress a soft tissue, so both skin and muscle, between two harder surfaces. So one surface might be a bony prominence inside the body, and another surface could be a hard bed or a hard chair. And when tissue is compressed between this bony prominence and this, this hard external surface, um, the interior soft tissue becomes uh, deformed and distorted, and this change in shape uh, can result in things like um, occlusion and then for, therefore cell death. And so common sites for pressure ulcers are actually where there are bony prominences, particularly in bed-bound or wheelchair-bound individuals. So we see them on the back of the head, the shoulders, the elbows, the buttocks, and the heel quite frequently. But despite the name, they're not just caused by uh, pressure and actually other forces such as shear have a huge role in um, the formation of pressure ulcers because both pressure and shear result in the same thing tissue distortion that leads to um, this uh, cell death and formation of the ulcer so you can imagine if there's a tissue distortion caused by either pressure or shear it could directly lead to a change in shape of either keratinocytes or fibroblasts just leading to leading them to um, um, uh, apoptose or Alternatively, um, this uh, pressure or shear could lead to distortion of capillaries resulting in their occlusion and therefore a decrease in the amount of blood getting to the tissue. This can lead to ischemia and eventually that can also lead to necrosis. So there's different ways that pressure ulcers can form, but they all occur as a result of uh, this tissue distortion that we see in response to pressure and shear. And while there's a nice linear relationship between uh, increasing pressure and the occurrence of ulceration, uh, if you add shear into the mix, it, it really is quite deleterious and you can have pressure ulcers occurring where there's absolutely no pressure at all and you just have shear. And this is a huge problem in some individuals, particularly amputees, because when they put on their prosthetics, there's a huge amount of shear that is um, uh, that the skin is exposed to um, when they're putting both putting their prosthetic on and also walking around and using their prosthetic. And this large amount of shear at the skin prosthetic interface means that um, many amputees suffer from skin problems on their stumps. And a third of these uh, skin problems, these dermatoses, are pressure ulcers. 
And while um, prosthetics have come a really long way since a whalebone was used as a prosthetic, the treatment has not uh, progressed so uh, rapidly. And it is still recommended that if you have a pressure ulcer, you just temporarily discontinue wearing your prosthetic limb up until the time when the uh, pressure, ulcer, pressure ulcer has healed. And so most of the approaches to try and alleviate this or, or mitigate against this focus on modification of the external environment, the outside in approaches. They look at um, redesigning the, the prosthetic so it fits in a different manner, redistributing shear and pressure across the stump. Um, they focus on introducing or altering the liner of the prosthetic. Uh, which could increase uh, wicking away of, of sweat and therefore reduce friction and therefore reduce shear uh, and, and so on. But the kind of take home message is that they all focus on the external environment, but you still inherently have the same issue, which none of these approaches are going to uh, help with. And that is that stump skin is just not designed to be walked on. Um, stump skin is, is body skin that has now got a new function. Um, so the skin on the stump might have regenerated, but the function is that it needs to be load bearing. And um, so being a skin lab, we wondered, well, can we just re-engineer stump on skin on the stump to become load bearing in the first place. So it would be an inside out approach that we alter the properties of the skin opposed, as opposed to altering the external environment. Um, and so for this, we would need to take inspiration from a site that is load bearing. Uh, and we think that the sole of the foot is load bearing. And I say we think that it is because there are clear adaptations within the feet as a, uh, as a whole which enable the feet to be load bearing. So for example, on the heel, there, there is a fat pad that protects uh, the skeleton against impact. And we know that the skin is different. I mean, you just have to look at the skin on your feet and you know that it's different, but we don't know how that enables it to be load bearing. We think it is load bearing because there's a type of amputation known as a syme amputation, which is when the heel pad is actually grafted onto the stump. Um, and this was introduced by a Scottish surgeon in 1843. And actually these individuals can directly walk on their um, stumps without even needing to use prosthetics. So we're guessing the skin does actually have quite good load bearing um, capacity. Um, but we can't go grafting uh, heel pads onto every amputee, especially um, as it wouldn't be a solution for existing amputees. And so we need to figure out how we can actually re-engineer skin potentially into foot skin to make it uh, capable of bearing load. But before we put too much effort into re-engineering skin, we wanted to actually identify what makes foot skin load bearing, if it is load bearing, uh, to get some design parameters which we can uh, work towards when we're trying to figure out how to re-engineer the stump. And so we hypothesize that foot skin is load bearing and that it's a combination of um, kind of the architecture, the morphological features and the uh, composition, the mechanical features of foot skin or planter skin that protect it from uh, breaking down under load. And so first we needed to actually confirm that foot skin is load bearing and it's not just other properties of the, the foot that protect the skin. Um, and so to do this, we perform mechanical testing on foot skin versus leg skin from the same individuals. So we took these eight millimeter um, cores of skin and we, uh, we conducted these indentation uh, tests. So essentially we apply load, in this case, 10 kilopascals of uh, compressive load uh, to the piece of skin. And the output that we read is uh, strain or tissue distortion. We look at how much the tissue changes shape in response to this input of load. The next thing we then do is hold the load for another 300 seconds to see how 
the tissue continues to change shape or if it continues to change shape. And that change in shape that we would observe from holding the load is known as creep strain. So we did this to compare uh, the response of both foot skin, planter skin, and leg skin, non-planter skin, to uh, 10 kilopascals of compressive load. And when we applied um, this, um, uh, this uh, 10 kilopascals of stress, we found that foot skin deformed by around 15% whereas leg skin actually deformed by almost 25%. And then when we looked at um, creep strain, we found uh, when we maintained the stress for an additional 300 seconds, we found that the foot skin deformed a little bit more, but the leg skin deformed significantly uh, more over this same time period. So it really wasn't very good at withstanding this compressive load. Obviously, we're also interested in shear, particularly because um, of uh, the, the deleterious effect that shear has on the stump. And so we then looked at how foot skin could, uh, or if foot skin could withstand uh, two kilopascals of shear load. And we found that uh, foot skin did deform by around 40% or change shape, um, whereas leg skin actually uh, changed shape by almost 100%. And then when we looked at creep strain, again, we found this um, slight change in shape in, in the foot skin and a increased or greater change of shape in the leg skin. So this tells us that foot skin actually can, um, is pretty good at withstanding load, especially compared to leg skin. Why is this? Um, as I said, you just need to look at your skin on your foot and you, you can tell that it's different. We know that it's thicker um, and we wanted to quantify uh, the differences between foot skin and uh, leg skin to see uh, really what differences or what were the, were the key differences in morphology were. And so this is leg skin on the top. Uh, the red is the epidermis and the blue is the dermis. And you can see straight away that it's much um, thicker in foot skin compared to leg skin. Actually, the, the stratum corneum, which is the top layer of the skin, is around 16 times thicker in um, foot skin compared to leg skin. And actually, if you look here at the um, boundary between the red and the blue, uh, this is the epidermal dermal junction where we have this uh, relatively nice interdigitation in uh, leg skin. And you can see in foot skin, it's really highly interdigitated um, relative to uh, leg skin. So this is another morphological difference between the two skin types. The epidermis um, also expresses or harbors different cytoskeletal proteins compared to uh, leg skin. Uh, this yellow stain here is a protein. This, <laughs> I think I was muted uh, briefly, sorry. Um, this yellow stain here is a stain known as keratin-9, um, which is not present in leg skin. Um, and we also used a second harmonic generation imaging to look at the collagen architecture in foot skin versus leg skin. And in foot skin, there's just a larger amount of collagen and a higher proportion of thick collagen fibers relative to thin fibers. So we know uh, a few things now about, about foot skin. We know that it does uh, deform less under both compressive and shear forces and its epidermis is thicker and expresses different cytoskeletal proteins. And within the dermis there's an increase in the total amount of collagen and the fibers themselves are also thicker. So we, we wanted to know how these differences like in the cytoskeletal proteins and the collagen composition actually um, translated into differences in the material properties between the different skin layers. And so we decided to use atomic force microscopy to um, perform kind of nanoscale indentation tests across these different skin layers that the planter um, 
the stratum corneum, the viable epidermis and the dermis of foot skin versus uh, non uh, planter skin or leg skin. And we mapped um, uh, the, the material properties and we found that in every layer, the stratum corneum, the epidermis and, and the dermis, that the foot skin was always significantly stiffer than its respective counterpart in leg skin. And so we wanted to kind of um, compile all of this data together. And so we decided to create this computational model of leg skin and foot skin to evaluate how the two types of skin perform under different loading conditions. And so we generated this model based on histological images. We segmented these into the different layers of the skin, the stratum corneum, uh, the epidermis in green and the dermis in blue. And then we applied a mesh to these um, images so we could integrate them into a finite element model. And we input into these the different parameters that we had measured, the kind of uh, macroscopic scale um, material properties that we had got from the indentation uh, tests on whole pieces of skin and the um, Young's modulus that we had obtained from the indentation tests on the different layers of the skin. And we simulated application of both compressive and, and shear load, and we output shear strain as our measurement. Um, so shear strain is a, a measurement of how much the tissue changes shape. And so we use this as a proxy for tissue distortion and consequently, consequently ulcer or pressure ulcer formation. Because as I uh, told you at the beginning, um, pressure ulcers form as a result of distortion of the tissue due to compressive and shear loading. And so we took our uh, finite element uh, meshes and we simulated application of both compressive load and then shear loading. And as I said, we output shear strain. And so you can see just by uh, looking at these images without me even going into detail of them that there is a huge amount of shear strain that observed in leg skin relative to the shear strain in planter skin. And both of these pieces of skin have been subjected to exactly the same loading conditions, um, which tells us that differences in both the morphology of these two skins and the material properties, the stiffness of these two different skins um, leads to these differential um, effects that we see in different response to loading. But you can imagine that if there was a capillary or a cell in this area of a kind of dark red here, that that capillary or that cell would be very distorted um, and potentially leading to occlusion of this papillary and therefore tissue necrosis. Whereas we never see these um, really kind of dark red patches in the foot skin, which means that all the cells in this foot skin um, are under very low levels of shear strain and are not really distorted or changing shape um, at all. And as I said, the main differences between these two skins are the morphology of the skin and the material properties of the skin. And so we wanted to work out, well, which one is it? Is it the material properties or is it the morphology that is conferring this load bearing capacity to foot skin? And so we essentially created knockout models, either knocking out um, the material properties or knocking out the um, morphological properties to evaluate how foot skin is protected against load bearing or is capable of bearing load. And we used a uh, body skin as our uh, reference. And then we changed properties of body skin toward to a planter um, phenotype and looked at whether this protected the foot skin or reduced the shear, peak shear strain. And so if we first look at composition, uh, this is changing the um, foot skin, uh, sorry, leg skin. So it has the material properties of foot skin. 
um, but keeps the morphology of leg skin, we see that there is a big decrease in the peak shear strain or the amount of tissue deformation, both within the epidermis and within the dermis relative to our baseline. If we look at the effect of morphology, so we keep um, the material properties the same as our reference leg skin, but we change the morphology to that of foot skin, we see there is a slight decrease in peak shear strain within the epidermis, but really there's no um, benefit of changing the morphology um, to the peak shear strain in the dermis. And so from this, we can conclude that morphology does little to protect uh, foot skin against ulceration. And it's actually the material properties, the composition of foot skin. So the the keratin nine expression and the collagen architecture that protects most against high shear strains and therefore pressure ulcers. And so if we want to focus on, if we want to re-engineer stump skin to make it load bearing and protect against pressure ulcers, we need to figure out a way to re-engineer it so its composition becomes like that of foot skin. Um, I've just added this in to say we did do quite a lot of other analysis looking at um, different readouts and also why a skin is thick and, and skin thickness is important. It just doesn't protect against pressure ulcers, which we, which we were interested in here. Um, but skin thickness or the thickness of foot skin does protect it against blisters and also against tears. But I, I haven't shown you that data. And just lastly, to kind of um, round this off. We started off this project because we wanted to figure out um, if we could re-engineer stump skin to a foot skin phenotype, would it actually um, be worth us doing? Like, would it confer a protective effect? And so to just quickly assess this, we generated um, an idealized model of a residual limb and simulated donning a prosthetic uh, or donning a prosthesis and standing. And you can see that in the skin, there are high amounts of shear strain, um, which explains why uh, ulcers frequently occur on this site. And then when we change the properties of the skin to that of foot skin or planter skin, you can see um, just by looking at the change in color that there is a decrease in the peak shear strain, especially in the skin, um, which potentially could confer protection to this site. The cells here would be under much less uh, stress if they were foot skin cells as opposed to uh, leg skin cells. And we can quantify this. So we do, do see a decrease in peak shear strain across the, along this path A to, to B, which um, would result in less cell deformation and potentially less ulceration on, the, on this site. So just to um, kind of wrap this up, I've shown you um, three quite different uh, projects today, which all sort of um, have similar goals in a way. Uh, they all focus on skin regeneration and, and scar remodeling. And firstly, I showed you the project that Helena had done where we showed that the secretome or the factors that hair follicle fibroblasts secrete can accelerate closure of skin wounds in vitro and ex vivo. And now we're trying to figure out, is it safe to use in patients? And can we also use it in chronic wounds? I then told you about Magdalena's project, um, an in vivo study where we showed that introduction of hair follicles into scars can promote a remodeling of that scar tissue. And we're now trying to figure out how the hair follicle does it so we can promote remodeling of scar tissue without using a hair follicle. And then lastly, I told you about Colin's project, figuring out what makes foot skin load bearing to give us some uh, design parameters uh, to kind of now aim for when we're looking at remodeling tissue on the stump. And with that, uh, thank you all very much for listening. Um, also big thank you to all my funders uh, these projects that I've spoken about today were funded by the Medical Research Council, the EPSRC, and the Rose Trees Trust. And we couldn't do 
of course, uh, working with humans, you can't do any of uh, this work without the patients themselves and also the our clinical collaborators, the Fajo Hair Institute and the Meditechnia Clinic who provide us with all our tissue samples. And with that, uh, yeah, thank you for listening and I'll take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Claire. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I'm sure everyone else thought, thought the same. We've got a, a few questions here that I'll try and take in, in reverse order. Uh, unfortunately, although the first one that was asked, um, although I remembered what the the reference to it was at the time, I can't remember now. So I'd like to ask uh, Salik Imran if he could uh, re um, ask the question to, to tell me what it, it is that you think is sebum. Um, but uh, yeah, let's move move down through now. Um, and what what do we have? And the first one is from uh, Brian Hogan. Uh, does this research have any potential impact on the treatment of skin conditions like eczema? Um, potentially. Um, so in eczema, the skin barrier is um, compromised. The, the epidermis in eczema is a little bit thinner, but the, the barrier is essentially um, compromised it's compromised in a different way like it's obviously not a, a physical injury or an incision but it is compromised so the hair follicle um secretome the first project that i spoke about um could facilitate um re-establishment of the skin barrier in conditions like eczema yeah okay and uh, a double question from Fiona Barclay. Uh, first of all, is it uh, possible hair follicles, just their physical anchoring effect um, helps? And uh, then let's see, I'm trying to lead into the second question now. What skins makes color very effectively? And is that somehow protective in a way? Well, I think that's, that was, yeah, that sounded asked just now. So is it the thickness of, of the calluses that foot skin makes that, that also? Um, has an effect? Um, so the thickness of, uh, we, we used a different readout when we were looking um, in, our, in our models. So I showed you our readout with shear strain, which we used as a proxy for um, tissue deformation and therefore the incidence of pressure ulcers. But we also performed another readout using a metric known as von Mises stress. And this tells us the likelihood that a tissue will fail. And when we, so, so we used it as a proxy for blistering or tearing. Mm -hmm. And when we created our knockout models, um, looking at the effect of either morphology or composition on the skin and the resultant von Mises stress, we found that the skin composition had absolutely nothing to do with um, protection against high or peak von Mises stress, but the thickness of skin did. So we concluded that if your skin is thick, it's much more likely to tear or blister than if your skin is thin. And actually it, with age, there is a big decrease in the thickness of the epidermis. Um, mm -hmm. And then we see more blisters and tears in elderly individuals with thinner skin. So it sort of all ties in together. And the other question about the hair follicles and the anchoring <laughs> effect, that's a really good question. And it's something we, we don't know the answer to yet. We plan on generating a, um, a again, a, probably a computational model to see whether, how the presence of hair follicles alters the mechanics in the surrounding skin. Uh, because mm -hmm. do you just need to put a stick or a kind of a wire or something like that in to recreate the presence of a hair follicle and alter surrounding tissue mechanics? Or is it actually a cellular effect of the hair follicle? And we, we hope that it's a cellular effect of the hair follicle, but we haven't discounted that it is just a mechanical effect yet. So yeah, it's, that's it's a, really a very, good question. It's a very rich field, isn't it, in terms of what you still have and still want to research? The practical applications 
and and the life changing side of it as well because you know this is all medicine for for people whose whose lives have been you know severely affected by the injuries that they received whether it's diabetic ulcers or amputation um, and then just I'll, I'll wrap up uh, two questions in one from Arlo and Imran because I think they're, they're two aspects of the same question which is stem cells have any effect on this research and from uh, Imran uh, so it's um, the could we take the desired skin cells and grow them in the lab uh, was this related to the fit skin work um, well, I suppose it's for everything really for wounds um, and so f well f I can answer I'll answer it for the um, stump skin work so Normally, um, when people think of cell therapies, they think of replenishing stem cells. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if we could take foot skin stem cells and implant them into, onto a stump, then those stem cells would, would, would take over. Um, but we have a simpler uh, approach that we're actually going to try first. Um, so it's known during skin development that there are interactions between the, the fibroblasts and the epithelium. And I'm quite fibroblast centric, as you might have got from my talk. Um, but to me, the, the stem cells are in the epithelium, but the fibroblasts are the conductors of the orchestra and the stem cells are just the players. And so we know that the fibroblasts that are present within foot skin, if you take them and you combine them with stem cells from body skin, the fibroblasts will reprogram the stem cells and make them into foot skin stem cells. So actually we propose to try, a, um, it would be an autologous fibroblast cell therapy whereby we could take fibroblasts from a, a patient from the foot or the hand and inject them into the stump. And once they're in the stump, they'll reprogram the stem cells. Um, so they become like foot skin and then they start producing cells that express keratin nine um, and the presence of the fibroblasts can result in a change in the collagen architecture of the stump as well. So we think that using fibroblast cell therapy instead of a stem cell therapy will actually enable us to target both the epidermis and the dermis at the same time. Whereas if we just used a stem cell therapy, we would only target the stem cells in the epidermis. Okay. Well, the, there are a lot more um, interesting questions to, to pose that are in the list there, but we, we have somewhat run over on time. So last the, the people who asked those questions are not passed on, forgive me. Um, uh, I, I found it absolutely fascinating, as, as I say, the medical chats to me are always the life-changing ones. Um, but one thing I will say is that the, the breadth of technique that you've talked about in just a uh, single hour from finite element modeling to, to gene, gene tracking uh, to everything else that you've done just shows that you you really utilize the, the technical skills available within the college to the extreme and, and then some as well with your contacts. So what I'll do now is to pass over to, to David for his uh, finishing words. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, it's an absolutely excellent talk. I'm really grateful that you've come along tonight. And uh, over to you, David. Thank you, John. Well, thank you, Claire. I, I, absolutely marvelous. I was... Uh, completely riveted and now sensitively feeling each part of my skin to make sure <laughs> it's behaving itself. Um, really, I'd just like to uh, ask everybody if they would show their appreciation, which I'm sure is as great as mine, uh, but in the usual manner. I don't know if they can be unmuted or alternatively, there's a symbol you can use uh, somewhere down on the bottom of the screen to show your appreciation. So thank you very much, Claire. Okay, uh, that said, this isn't the end of the 
uh, pleasure for some of us. So there will be a small party afterwards in about five, ten minutes' time for members who'd like to join us. Uh, this is a members-only session for a talk with Claire and indeed with other members to try and recreate a little the social side of uh, our friends' society. Um, with that, I will. With that, I will um, also remind you that the next event is a week tomorrow, Friday, the fifth of March, and that will be one of our friends, uh, Sir Jim Verdi, uh, from uh, physics department, but also from CERN. He'll be reporting, as John said, on. Um, advances post Higgs boson at CERN. Uh, I think I should also probably remind you that uh, we're, we have a, a fundraising activity uh, on our website. It's easy to contribute and uh, please do. And if you're a tax player, please remember we can uh, gain money from your tax uh, if you mark it. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And um, see you next time and see the members later on this evening. Thank you. <laughs>